Be of good cheer. You're not an object. All of our lives, we take ourselves to be objects. We go to school, we're assigned a chair, we're assigned a name. People address us as if we are real objects. But Ian, you're not an object. You're an object by someone who looks from outside at you and they just see your body and your mouth moving and the sound coming out, speaking God knows what about God knows what. Then people give you attributes, he's dumb. He's really smart. He's a worthless hunk, whatever. And gradually our identity takes shape. But we are not that. In Western philosophy, philosophers talk about the world of form, and shadows and light, the existential world, the world that appears and is filled with objects. This is called the phenomenal world the world of appearances. And they invented another supposed existence. They call the noumena world. Which theoretically is the world behind the appearances. So we see a car, we see its color, its lines, we can touch it and it feels metallic. We can hear the engine start up and the roar of it. We can smell the exhaust fumes. And we know more or less how it works. But what is the car like outside of our senses? Outside of the color we see? the metallic touch, the heaviness, the smell of the exhaust, the sight of its frosted windows. What is it like by itself, unseen, unheard? This is the nominal world. You really can't know much about the noumenal world of an automobile. How can you talk about a car other than talking about its appearances? There's only one real word, world object that we can talk about what it's like to be that object, and that's you.
I can talk about Ian. Describe him. Same with Eric. I can describe him. Sing his praises or damn his actions. I can talk about Putin, Biden, Obama. I can spend all day talking about objects and their description and their function and my evaluation of them, how smart they are, how dumb they are, how pretty that car is, how powerful another car is. And all of our descriptions that we can think of are about objects. But if you ask about what a thing is like into itself or onto itself, we can't say anything about the numinal nature of an automobile. We can talk about it in terms of atoms and molecules and metallic properties and melting points and all of that. But that's still about appearances, the phenomena of it. Even though the phenomena is unseen, like in atoms, it's a conceptual construction of a finer part. of the world that we see, hear, taste, and touch. But it's only ourselves that we can talk about. As the self, as it is in itself, this body, Ed, Ed can only talk about his own experience of what himself is. But the thing is, when he describes his own experience, he has to use the concepts which are used to describe the external world. Ed can describe himself as being a noumena, which means he says he's not an object, he's a subject. What are the properties of a subject? Well, you know, that's hard to say. Because if I investigate myself, my vision, my inner vision is of darkness and light and shadows and forms. The sound of a car engine outside. All of these things are really descriptions about objects. We really don't have words to describe ourselves as subjects. When we start describing ourselves we use terms that are appropriate to subjects, like speaking of the emotions we have or of mind. But try to capture what the mind really is from the inside, not talk about the specific thoughts, but mind as a whole, you can't do it. Words can't touch who you are. Even in the, the vast panoply of Eastern philosophy, when the scriptures describe who you are, they do it in words which are appropriate for objects 
or the description of a field of objects. But they can't really describe how you perceive yourself or the world. Probably the closest comes if you say either, I am consciousness and so is everything in the world. All the things I'm conscious of. But that ignores the fact that there's a difference between the subject and the object. I as the subject, really, I can't find anything in me that I can describe as being me. I could get clever and say I am the knower. And that may open up some boxes for me. I can say I am spirit and I like that one. because that immediately takes me as something apart from objective phenomena. But mostly in order to really describe myself, I have to be silent because words paint pictures and what I am it's not a picture. You can get a picture of my body or maybe draw illustrations of the relationship between my mind and my body. But those are just words about objects. That's making the subjective into an objective. I can say you're the perceiver of the world and your own subjectivity. But what does that tell you that you don't already know? You might say that what you are is a mystery because you can't capture what you are in words. Words are the only thing we know how to use to describe anything. Big, small, lively, dull, greasy, slimy, hot, rough, fine, empty, full. So many words, words, and they all miss the point when it comes to describing yourself. That's why when Pilate asked Jesus who he was, Jesus answered, I don't know. Because there's nothing in knowledge that can capture the spiritual essence of each person as they are in themselves. Only they can know it and express it. And they express it in ways that they hope other people will understand by using common words in an uncommon way. To know yourself you can only be yourself and be aware of your being self, which means to sink into yourself, sink into your experience of your body, your mind, your muscles, your emotions. And from that position, you can speak about anything.
So why do you want to know who and what you are? Why do people seek self-knowledge? Because they don't know what the fuck's going on. I had, back in the old days when I was doing psychotherapy, I had one student I really loved. He was a, a man about 20 years younger than I was, body-wise. Incredibly intuitive. And torn by not knowing who and what he was. And one day he told me, when he died and reached the pearly gates, he had one question he wanted to ask God. And that question was, What the hell was that all about? The so-called life. What the hell was that all about? And generally, philosophers go way out of their way to give complicated answers. It's all about finding meaning in our life. It's all about emptiness. I am emptiness that is sentient. What does that mean? It means I'm not an object that I can find anywhere but I sense objects. What does that mean? Et cetera, et cetera. None of these answers really satisfy. They're just busy time things, entertainment. Entertainment between meals. Or instead of watching television, or instead of taking a car trip to Sedona, and we, many of us, occupy a great deal of time in our life. trying to figure out who and what we are in a way that we can state it to others. And even ways that they can learn how to be themselves without thoughts or words, just as we all are ourselves without thoughts and words except when we explore ourselves and we start applying words to ourselves, they don't fit. They only fit as we describe our objective aspects, but not the subjective one. And if you look deeply enough into who you are, as well as what other people are, 
realize you don't have a clue. There's really nothing to grasp. You can grasp things with words, concepts with words, ideas with words, but you can't grasp the subject. Only the objective, which is the phenomenal, the appearance. But the thing in itself, the ding an sich, the noumenal, is out of the range of description. And when we start describing it, it changes. It's the more and more we objectify our insides, our subjectivity, the more we give up our freedom of being nothing, so to speak, and acquire a new objectivity of our own inwardness. And this can go on for a long time. Could you describe our feelings? We describe how we see and what we see. We describe what we feel. And you know, no matter how much we do it and how well we do it, we really don't feel like we can describe ourselves. What I am escapes definition. So when it comes to knowing myself or describing myself, which are more or less the same thing, I'm utterly helpless. The strange thing is though, spiritual teachers and religious teachers from time immemorial have been telling people what they are. And people follow them. And they join one group or another, depending on their education and their intuition, how sophisticated their intellect is. Some like simple truths and they become born again Christians. Some lost souls become invitants, always dealing with problems of what exists and what doesn't exist and what's real and what's not real. So what are you? If you look inside, what do you see? Is looking this inside yourself imaginatively the same as an object knowing itself from the inside? We're kind of constrained in how we look at ourselves. It's both basically a visual point of view. We try to look into ourselves, which is look into that darkness in and around the heart. After a while, we find light. These are all things we experience. We don't identify with it. Over the years of practicing spirituality, you can have all kinds of experiences where temporarily you identify with a certain experience. Like when you get very familiar with experiencing emptiness in meditation, 
One day you might first experience yourself as the totality of emptiness within. Then you might identify with the totality of objects which you sense because you are absent, there's nothing there. So you become the world. And each of these experiences builds concepts about what the world is and what I am. Robert used to say, you are Brahman. And people would repeat that all the time. Back then we didn't have Facebook, but people in amongst Robert's group would talk like, don't get excited, the world isn't real. You know, I don't think they actually believe that. They were copying Robert and they thought it was an intelligent thing to say. But it's only Robert that thought that the world wasn't real. The rest of us thought the world was real. And we tried to grasp the not realness that Robert was talking about. I never, never really grasped the not realness. Now, I can. And what generally is meant is that the world of phenomena, of forms, is ever changing. It's like a continuously kaleidoscopic changing image with added sounds and smells and tastes and touch. It's a constant flow of sense data from objects in the external world. There's nothing that stays constant, it's all moving. Here one day, gone the next. And then we're emotionally attached to some of the objects. to our home, to our relationships, to our animals. And when we pass, we may feel a dreadful sense of loss or nothing at all. Now, Buddha says the way to freedom or nirvana comes when we have no more desire can also add on to that when we have no more habits. Desires or attachments are known in Sanskrit as vasana. And some yogis attempt to filter out all the vasanas in themselves so that they become empty. An empty gourd, so to speak, with no identifications, not identified with the body, not identified with the feelings. And yet when you're in psychotherapy, the psychotherapist, as you immerse in the emotions inside, allows yourself to be overcome by the greed, the loneliness, the loss, the anger, the love, bliss, and takes that as being the real you. but a spiritual person is not so lucky. 
because the teacher will say, you're still identified with objects, just more subtle objects than the rest of us are. Eddie has become so subtle that he's disappeared into the background. He's been doing that a lot lately, drifting in emptiness and darkness. It's a crapshoot. You can think of all of spirituality as an attempt to illuminate that which has no form. So the illumination only points out more subtle realms of objects, emotions, energies, God, and we get obsessed by these subtler objects within us. And we really notice that we can't grasp hold of ourselves. We just grasp, grasp more and more or less and less tangible sensations, emotions, energies. And we become obsessed by them. Like Mark with his bundle of coherent energies. But the wise man continues to look and finds that there's nothing he can grasp or she can grasp. And then we know that it's impossible to label what we are. We can then become very clever and talk about ourselves as being the root or the witness or the observer. But that which is there is not visible in any way. It's not like an emotion. It has no substance, no attributes. The knower is without any physical or objective or phenomenal aspect at all. It can't be seen, heard, tasted, or touched. It's beyond the realm of phenomenal existence. And supposedly when you realize that, you realize that what you are is beyond death because death happens to objects, to phenomena. And you're not a phenomena. And that realization is supposed to free you from the fear of death. The problem arises though that you know that your body's gonna die. So when the body dies, is that locus of sentience 
going to still exist in some form or not. And after you ponder that for a few years, you have to admit yourself, you don't know. And you'll have to lay down the koan, what am I? And say, I have no idea. Or maybe you do have a foggiest of an idea because you can seem to grasp the totality of yourself by resting in yourself. But you can't express what that is. Even if you give it a name, the name is something external and really doesn't seem to fit because you know what you're trying to describe is beyond sentience. It's beyond being dis defined. It's beyond being experienced, except as you experience it as you. Realize even saying I am, in no way describes the absolute, describes what you are. It just describes two words. One is a noun and the other is an adjective or a, a verb, I guess. Amnes is a verb. But no matter how hard you look, you can't find an eye. And then you say, well, the observer must be I. That's what they're talking about. But I don't see any I attached to the observer. It's just a word. And yet the mantra I am is all over. You see it in Advaita, Neo Advaita. in lots and lots of places. Amnes means existence, but what does existence mean for the existent? What does the existent mean for Mark or Michael T or Michael K or Maxi? or VJ, or Frank. Does anybody have the slightest clue as to they are, who they are, and what they are? Or like Christ, you have to admit, I don't know. I don't know what I am. Words apply only to the phenomenal universe, not to the noumenal. Descriptions only apply to the phenomenal wor world, the world of appearances, but not to the noumenal, the subject. So in the end, the wise man Stop searching for himself and says to himself, oh, fuck, what's on television tonight? Or what's for dinner? There's nothing to be known. And that's literally the case. There's no thing in you to be known. You're not a thing. You're not an object.
what you are is literally outside of existence, watching existence. So what you are is beyond existence altogether. You can talk about it, but that kind of talk about nothingness or the subject goes nowhere. You just start pounding nails into cardboard. Nothing sticks really. And if you're wise, you give it up. You say, I don't know. I don't know what I am. I don't know what you are. I don't care. Pass the water. Or the beer. Or have a cup of coffee. And suddenly you're free of the mind and the need for the mind to know these things. Because the mind does that, it knows things. And there's a parent feeling of power the more we know, it makes us arrogant. As we know, and other people don't know the truth. Don't hold so strongly to your truths. Every truth spoken by anyone is an untruth for someone else, is a lie for someone else. <laughs> 